I know you, and you're probably not investing the way you should. It's not that I know you, but most people fall into that category. That's why we've had a few episodes on investing, and here's one such episode. We sat down with Eric Zamel from UBS Financial Services to discuss what is so powerful about investing, how to get started, things you should be aware of as you start to invest. And yeah, you may have Robinhood on your phone and you're invested in some stocks, but are you doing it right? We touched on those questions and the emotions behind investing. Like always, a very insightful episode. If you have any questions for Eric, hit him up. His email address is in the description of this podcast, this YouTube video. And we'd like to thank our sponsors, Kolal Chabad and Approved Funding. You'll hear more about them in this week's episode. But without further ado, the wonderful world of investing with Eric Samel. Being a Jew? Awesome. Managing personal finances? Not so awesome. Welcome to Kosher Money. We're here with Eric Zamel. Zamel, can pronunciation is difficult, but people want to know how to invest in a recession. That was the theme of why we said we have to fly you in from Los Angeles. Um, tell us who you are, what you do, and then we'll get into this bullet point list of the different topics we're going to discuss. It's nice to be here. Thank you. Uh, again, my name is Eric Samel. I'm a managing, managing director and private wealth advisor at UBS in Beverly Hills. Cool. So you've been at this for quite a few years. Over 20 years. So we did already have a recession back in 08. Let's talk about that. What was that like? And if we are to see a recession, we're in a recession to be determined. Um, tell us what we can expect. What was that experience like back in 08? I think 2008 was very different than what you have today. Uh, today feels more like an economic issue and not a financial crisis issue. 2008, uh, had the government not stepped in, uh, you could have had a real serious and long-term uh, financial decline. You had banks uh, going out of business. Uh, many banks went out of business, as we know. Uh, Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns were among the victims of that time period. And uh, the government had to intervene in a massive way, in an unprecedented way, in order to prevent things from declining uh, much more rapidly. Uh, today feels more like a slowdown. Uh, remains to be seen uh, the extent uh, to which there'll be a downturn, but it, it's, it's really caused by, by inflation and interest rates, and not so much uh, a, a financial catastrophe. Gotcha. So let's say whether this turns into a recession, 2036 turns into a recession, not that I know anything. Um, what should people be keeping in mind as it relates to investing, right? I think we can start with investing in general and then work our way towards the different climates and how to treat them differently. Um, but I guess let's start with investing, right? A lot of people here invest, a lot of people don't invest, right? Some people listening are in their 20s, some people are in their 50s. What should they know about investing? They're calling you up for the first time. Sure. T tell us. That's, it's a great question. So the question is, why, why is it important to invest in general? Um, I think in general, the reason why people invest is they want to attain financial freedom, right? They want to be able to uh, have enough resources and assets that they can spend time on what's important to them, family learning, whatever it is that, that's really most important. And financial freedom is really defined as having passive income that exceeds one's spending. Uh, th there was a term that was coined in, in the 1930s called being in a rat race. Uh, Robert Kiyosaki in his book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, uh, spends a lot of time explaining it. And the term really explains uh, an exhausting and frustrating financial routine that leaves no time for our desires and hobbies outside. And you see, as people earn more and more money, they increase their, their spending and their lifestyle. And people, uh, for the most part, for a large part, are not saving as much as they probably should. And there's a path that you see is very common. People go to school, they get good grades, uh, they go to college, they graduate, they land a job, usually as an employee. They have more disposable income, they update, upgrade their lifestyle, they spend more, they finance that spending with debt, and they start, stay in work to pay for that debt, and this is repeated until they retire. Mm. And this is something that's very common, uh, especially among uh, the middle class, um, and a high percentage of the world population today experiences this type of cycle. And it's a big problem because uh, people uh, opt for really comfort and safety. 
uh, they, they, they don't think about long-term planning and investing and people are spending largely what they're making and as they make more, they're spending more and upgrading their lifestyle. So that doesn't leave as much room uh, for savings and that's, that's a big issue. Uh, so the question is, how do you get out of this so-called rat race? Uh, you get out of it by doing four things. Number one, you improve your financial intelligence by reading, listening, and learning. You save each month. Uh, hopefully you increase your earnings and you have to invest systematically. So th those are the ways to, uh, to move beyond that. Never really thought of that in that as people make more money, they upgrade their lifestyles and that's a trap, right? Sure. When you hear someone who's investing or making more than they're spending and they don't increase their lifestyle, that's like a breath of fresh air to sure. you, right? Um, not to say that they can't be upgrading parts of their lifestyle, but if 50,000 is coming in a month and they're spending $50,000 a month, that's not a great ratio right there, right? So when, when people call you up and, and, you know, as a wealth advisor, is there a ratio? Is there a number? You know, if someone was making $10,000 a month, and they didn't need to be spending it on their bare minimums, you know, assuming they don't have a super large family. What, what is the number that you say to them, okay, you could be spending X, but I really want you to be doing A, B, and C with Y and Z? It's a good question. It really depends. Uh, it depends on their income. It depends on who they are, their family, what their spending habits are. Uh, but in general, you need to define a certain amount of your income that you're paying yourself, essentially. Right, you have a chunk that goes to taxes, you know, a chunk that goes to essentials, your house, your mortgage, uh, kids' school, tuition, and there's, there's a lot of variable, a lot of optional expenses. Um, people need to make sure that they're, they're paying themselves by setting aside a certain amount uh, before they start spending on the, the unnecessary things. So is there, is there a minimum there? Would you like to, is there a maximum? Um, let's start with the minimum. You know, let's, let's assume someone's spending 20k and their necessities are 12 or, or they're making 20k and their necessities are 10 12k do you say on a monthly basis you want to see a direct withdrawal from that into an investment account into a savings account um two-part question should it be automated and b i want to try to get a little bit more of like a, a concrete number for sure. the audience great question so if we give as a goal 10% of our income net of taxes to tzedakah, right. I would say that at least 10% you should be paying yourself and setting it aside and investing it and letting it grow. Mm -hmm. uh, you can keep money in the bank and keep it safe, but if it's not growing, it doesn't really do you good. It needs to be invested. It needs to be systematic. Um, and a lot of people say, well, I don't want to invest because it's too risky. Right? So you, you have to define risk. Right? So is a risk a loss of capital or is it a loss of purchasing power? Right? If I have my money in the bank and it's sitting earning interest, and two years from now, three years from now, my dollar doesn't buy as much as, as it did initially, mm -hmm. is that a risk? Right? If I look at my house value on Zillow, and I see the values fluctuating, you know, one day I'm up 20,000, 30,000, is it a risk? You know, if you see the right. value of the house declining in a particular day, how do people view that? Um, and the reality is, if over time, inflation's average about 3% a year. Right now it's closer to 9% you look over the last year or so. But if inflation average is about 33% per, a year, and today people retire, people retire in their 60s, they can be retired for 25 to 30 years. It's a long time to be in retirement, not working. Um, if inflation's at 3% a year, that means that consumer prices are gonna rise about two and a half times during retirement. So every dollar loses about 60% of its purchasing power and you'll need to come up with about $2.45 of income to purchase what a dollar buys today. Hmm. So think about that. You know, cost of stamps, just as an example, mm -hmm. about 30 years ago, cost of a stamp in the late 80s was about a quarter. I think in the early 90s, it was about 29 cents. You know what a stamp costs today? 50 something? 60 cents. <laughs> it's up to 60? So it's up two oh, to two no. and a half times right. over the last 30 plus years. Um, and that's really, that's consistent with what we said about inflation. If inflation is 3% a year, then a dollar today, 30 years from now, you're going to need to come up with $2.45 of income for what a dollar today buys. Wow. Um, so that, that, to me, that, that's a more of an erosion of, well, that's a bigger risk uh, that people need to be 
concern about. It must kill you when someone calls you up and, and you take a look at their finances and X thousands of dollars have been sitting in just a savings account losing value. Sure. Do you see that from time we, to time? We see it. We see it. Uh, we, we encourage people to, to invest and to put it away to grow, um, but we certainly see it. You know, a lot of people historically grew up thinking that CDs and cash is safe. Sure. Um, and people really misperceive risk in two ways. They, they overestimate the risk of holding securities and they under, underestimate the risk of not holding them. And the bottom line is you can't build wealth net of inflation by keeping money in just cash, CDs, and even bonds. Uh, there's more risk over time by keeping money in cash than, than investing it. Uh, and I can tell you over time that there's no 20-year period when you consider dividends reinvested. There's no 20-year period since the 1920s that shows a negative return uh, with stocks, with investing. Um, so over time, uh, it's, it, it's very important that people understand that keeping money in the bank is not safe over time because money erodes in value. So the money that you see in your statement, uh, even though it's static and it's not fluctuating, with each year with inflation, it's buying less and less goods and people have to understand that risk. Do people push back and say, okay, fine, the last 100 years there's been a pattern, but Eric, from 2020 to 2040, it's going to be a completely different script. You know, that's the way it was, but... Is that part of their concern, or is it just a lack of education on what's happened over the last hundred years, and the general theme is it should continue? People always feel that this time is different, and you see a downturn for whatever reason, you mm -hmm. see something geopolitical in the news, uh, and they always feel that this time is different. And the, the reality is that markets go through cycles, mm -hmm. they go through patterns, and they always rise over time as the economy is growing. Uh, we live in a country that... Uh, has had uh, among the greatest success stories economically out of any nation in the world. Um, and given the ingenuity and the people that live here in America, I think you have a lot of confidence to say that that's going to continue. Um, but to, to sit aside and, and to opt for safety essentially means that you're, you're embracing uh, comfort and safety today at the risk of losing purchasing power in the future. You know, it's much smarter to embrace a little bit of volatility today by investing in return for comfort and safety in the future as things grow. Whenever we talk investing, I always make a point to discuss the value of compounding over the years. Can you think of a story where you looked at someone who invested early and then you take a look 30, 40 years later just from the compound interest? And I'd love to you know, talk numbers here, but if someone listening is 21 years old, you know, first talk about the, the value of the compounding. I think we cannot iterate and reiterate that enough. And then I'd love to hear a story about what someone did at a young age smartly and then where they were when they wanted to retire. That's a great question. So there's a story that was in the, uh, in the newspapers and written up in books. It was a story of an employee at UPS who started work in his 20s, uh, in the 1920s, and never made more than $14,000 a year. True story. Never made more than fourteen thousand a year. Worked his whole career at UPS, but he saved twenty percent of his income and put it into his employer stock. Now, not necessarily something that everybody should do. It's not diversified, but the the the, the message of the story is consistent. The twenty percent of his income that he put away in his stock, by the time he got to his by the time he got to his late retirement years, was worth give me a number. A few hundred thousand dollars. It was worth about seventy million dollars. Wow. Uh, and that's, that's the lesson of compounding. Uh, I think Albert Einstein said that compounding, compounding interest is one of the most important, if not the most important invention in the history of, of humankind. Um, I, I've heard a client refer to it as the eighth wonder of the world. Uh, and I'll give you another example just to illustrate it. If you take a very simple level, $2,000 a month, uh, so $24,000 a year, and you're earning, so the market average is 8 to 10% historically, going back 100 years, let's say we take 9%, number in the middle. Mm -hmm. $2,000 a month, $24,000 a year, over 20 years, that will compound to about 1.2 million. And you go to 30 years, double that, you know, roughly 2.4 million. And that's just 2,000 a month. Mm. So imagine if somebody's saving 6,000 or 8,000 or 10,000. Uh, people today spend so much on all kinds of luxuries that are not necessarily necessary to put aside a little bit and to automate it uh, goes a huge way. And for someone, 
for someone listening that doesn't have two thousand, but they have two hundred dollars a month. It's proportional. So they, they, you would recommend that they still put that amount of money away because 100%. they're going to benefit from the value of compounding. One hundred percent. It's very important to have in your mind that you're you're paying yourself um, as opposed to spending on everything. Mm-hmm. You know, at the end of the day, people work, they get to retirement, and they don't they don't have savings. They don't have sufficient savings. And when you're not working, you have to have assets set aside that are that's going to generate income for you passively, um, in order to, to live. So you know, paying yourself now and investing it goes a huge way as interest compounds. Do you recommend to clients to set it and forget it, sort of automate it, or manually do this whenever they need to allocate a certain amount of money to so-called pay yourself? All right, so I think it's hugely important to do it systematically. I think your, your financial success over time comes from doing things systematically, having a routine um, and forgetting about it and just letting it automate. I mean, there, there, there are, every, every situation is different and you have some people that have income that comes in in spurts. It's not always consistent. They're not always on a W-2. Mm-hmm. Um, but to have something in place which is automatic uh, is hugely important and it allows you to grow without even thinking about it. Um, you know, on a simple level, if you're an employee and you're, employer offers a 401k, that's a way that you can save automatically uh, and have it grow and invest. And again, you don't need to think about it. It's investing on its own. It's being deducted from payroll. If you're an employer or you have your own business, uh, there's a lot of tax advantage plans that you can take advantage. You can set up your own 401k. You can set up a profit sharing. You can set up a pension. We have clients that are um, putting away hundreds of thousands a year into tax deferred accounts. So not only you're, you're saving and you're doing it annually, but you're getting a tax deduction for every dollar that you put away. So someone in a high bracket, we live in California, mm-hmm. the state tax at the highest level is 13.3%. So income at 37 plus 13.3, over 50% in taxes where we live in California. I think it's similar here in New York. But if you're putting away 100,000 and you're a business owner, you're, that's roughly 50 that you don't have to pay that's a hundred thousand you don't have to pay tax on. So you're saving roughly fifty for each year that you're contributing on to the plan. Uh, so that's hugely important. You know, instead of giving, if you have a hundred thousand of income, instead of giving roughly half to taxes in that year, the whole hundred thousand is working for you and compounding. Um, had you not done the plan, you pay tax on it, you net roughly fifty, and then you can invest the fifty. I'd rather invest the hundred mm-hmm. and let it compound. And we, we saw the illustration where if it's growing for 20 years, 30 years, how many mo- multiples of what you invest, what it grows to. For me, that was a big factor in investing when I saw the, the real-time tax benefit of putting money away. You know, my accountant calls me up. He says, by the way, if you invest, you know, X thousand, I could save you on your taxes this year, six, seven thousand. I'm like, what? Yeah, okay. You sure. know, so it, it's not just having this idea in mind where oh, I'm paying myself, but I'm legitimately saving money on legally not having to give that to Uncle Sam. What are, we we talk biases a lot also in terms of investing, you know, and and emotion is such a a key factor when it comes to investing, you know. I would imagine a lot of your calls are more emotional based than they are strategy or people thinking logical. What are some of the biases or the emotions that you run into when you're having an initial conversation with a prospective investor and how do you battle that? So I think emotions play a huge part in investing. With with investing, it's counterintuitive. You know, most businesses, when things are on sale, everyone's running to the store to buy. Uh, ours is the only business that I know of when things are on sale, when the market's down, people are running away, if you will. Um, people are scared, you know, when the market's down, it's going to fall more, they think. Um, but again, the only business in the world that I can think of when things are on sale, you're running away instead of running towards it. Uh, d- d- big down markets, you know, bear markets where the market's down in excess of 20% historically happen every six and a half to seven years. Um, so whenever that sale happens, uh, it behooves you not to take advantage of it in some respect. And back to the systematic purchasing you know, when you have a down market and you're buying every month, you, you view down market as an opportunist rather than as a victim. When you're purchasing shares automatically because you're buying more shares at cheaper prices. Um, pe- pe- people make, make a few mistakes when it comes to investing. Um, and it, it, number one, they feel that, you know, that this time is, is different. 
and that you know we shouldn't invest because this time is different. Things are not going to recover as they usually do. Um, the reality is, is uh, markets always react first and think later. So markets usually go down more than they necessarily should, and then eventually set on balance out. Uh, but in time, as long as corporations are growing, as long as people are spending, that lifts the economy. The economy is 70% consumer spending. Mm. So when you hear a recession, you hear a downturn, you see people on the street spending in stores, people are traveling. As long as people are spending, the economy is growing. And corporations are earning, and so stock prices over time will, will rise. Mm -hmm. um, stocks historically do well in inflation. Uh, cash does poorly. Bonds usually don't do so well also during inflation. Stocks over time rise with inflation because higher prices are passed through to consumers. Corporations charge more for goods and services, and so earnings of stocks will increase over time as well. When people call you up, are they asking for your advice and then they ultimately make the decision or do people call you up and say hey here's my money i'm not as smart as you i don't have the experience i want you to do with it what you please and i trust you and then you might have some people call you up and like almost every week say how's my money doing um what should we be doing i saw a tip from a friend and you know people when they hear investing how involved should they be and could they be in in the conversation and in the growth of their money i think we get both uh, most clients will give us uh, discretion to invest and to manage a portfolio as as we see fit uh, some want to have more of a hands-on say as to what what's being bought what's being sold um, so it really depends i'd say you know 80 percent 90 percent We'll allow our team to have discretion. We'll make the choices and the decisions over time. Um, I think it's very important that uh, if you're an investor, you try to remove emotions from the table, from, from, the, from the process. Uh, emotions usually make you do the wrong thing at the wrong time. So when you see statement values going down, your, Which inc I have. your yes. inclination is to sell, right. to push the sell button. Uh, when you have somebody that's overseeing it for you, uh, that person hopefully will invest without the emotion and we'll be able to make decisions based on based on intellect based on facts uh, that there was a study done recently a few studies where they take a, a market index or a fund over a 20-year period 30-year period and the one study that I have in mind they took a, a stock fund that tracked the S&P and the stock fund over time had done close to 10.8 percent mm -hmm. per year for the 20-year period that they were looking at but the average investor had a return that was very different from the fund or from the index. And you would think, well, how could it be? The investor should have the same return as the fund is performing. Uh, but the reality is the average investor in that particular fund, and it could be in an index, was about half. So it was about 4.8% versus the fund being over 10%. Mm. So why, why is that? Because the average investor sells at the wrong time and usually buys back in at the wrong time too. Um, and that's just investor psychology. Investor psychology is counterintuitive and people, people get emotional when it comes to investments. Uh, Billy Bean in, in the book Moneyball made a movie about it. He was the manager of the Oakland A's and I, one of his quotes that I remembered is he hates losing a lot more than he cares to win. And that, that's a reality for a lot of people. People will have an increase in their value by a certain amount, it doesn't really change them. You invest in something, it goes up. They're not, they're not changing their lifestyle. But if you invest and you see it go down a little bit, it starts to sting you. Oh, it hurts. And it makes you feel bad. Yeah, I get these statements. So let's say I've been putting in the last few years, you know, maybe $15,000 away, $20,000, 25, whatever it is. And then I get a statement now and it's down 14,000. I'm like, "Oh man, why did I do this? I should just held on to the cash. I would be $11,000 richer, you know, factoring in the loss of cash value." But I know and I'm not making a call. I'm sure everyone's in the same boat in terms of what they're seeing out there. But the fact that I'm not in control of that or that I would have to call someone and try to sell him on trying to, you know, sell what I have plays a role. But but there is a lot of emotion every time that statement comes. I don't even look at it. I just throw it out because, like, I'm not doing anything anyway. So why should I see how much I'm down in the so-called short-term. Sure, P people are always tempted to sell when things go down thinking they can buy back when it's cheaper. Right. Right? You, you have, a, you have a, a feeling that things are getting worse. 
Um, markets usually bottom when everyone's running away. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll tell you, we're, with our own clients, uh, clients for the most part will hold through down cycles and, and try to, we try to encourage people to view it as an opportunity. But it, it always happens throughout any correction or downturn that the point at which we get the most phone calls and the most pressure to sell, almost always within a day or a week marks the bottom and the inflection point interesting. in markets, which is interesting. You know, to, to sell and to be right, you gotta be right twice, right? You gotta be right that when you sell, it's gonna keep going down. And you gotta be right again that when you go back in, it's not gonna be higher than when you got out. Mm -hmm. If you're an investor and you hold, you just have to be right once, that over time, things are gonna rise. And that's something that we try to stress to people. Um, that, that's something very important to keep in mind. We'll be right back to this week's episode, but first, a word from our sponsor, Kol El Chabad. Rosh Hashanah is coming, and there's no better time to give to the needy in Israel. Here's a quote from someone who wrote in to Kol Chabad. Standing up makes me dizzy. I think about food all the time. It's an empty feeling that's always there. And with Kol Chabad, we have the ability to fight that hunger. And poverty and hunger doesn't happen overnight. They say it happens little by little until these families find themselves in a dark and terrible place. And that's where Kol Chabad comes in. They're giving food and resources to thousands and thousands of needy families. And we need your help. We're going to put a link in the description, kolachabad.org slash kosher money. Whatever you can give, a dollar, a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, sign up, eighteen, thirteen, thirty-six dollars a month. You can give a recurring, um, and you can fight, you know. $38 uh, buys a shirt, a raincoat, and a pair of shoes for a needy or orphan child. If you want to give more, you can give $186. $186 feeds a hungry Israeli family with children for two entire weeks. It's fascinating. They have a soup kitchen, um, and their soup kitchen and their other kitchens are working overtime ahead of the holidays. So, Whatever you can give to help rescue our brothers and sisters in Israel, it can go a long way. Some of you have donated thousands of dollars, and some of you have donated $10. And every donation counts. So I don't want you to think just because you only have a few dollars to give that it doesn't help. It truly helps. It's a, it's a Ramir Balanes charity, and they've been at this for over 200 years. So again, visit the link in the description. Give, give, give. Let us know that you gave. And... Um, in that merit, may you and your family have a happy, healthy new year. And now back to this week's episode with Eric Zamel. So it's interesting because your job, what, you know, what you're experiencing in the summer of 2022 could be very different than what the summer of 2023 holds, right? Like, I'm just thinking about it from your shoes where if someone's a marketing manager, okay, they have campaigns, they run marketing campaigns, and, you know, what they're doing now is going to be very similar maybe a few different platforms to what it is in three, four years from now. But like literally month to month, week to week, your day, the phone calls, your, your fielding, the emotions sometimes could be extremely positive and sometimes can be extremely negative. So like, I, I don't even know if this is a question as much as it is an observation on, on my part in that your day to day, week to week is is extremely different, right? Like is that does that keep it exciting? Does that does that keep you on your toes? Um, how do you deal with that? It's a good point. Uh, I think we're 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 generally a lot busier when markets are more choppy and volatile, there's more to do, there's more more incoming phone calls coming in. Um, but that that's just the reality. You know, uh, I think investor behavior, um, we realize being in, my, in our position as, as, as money managers, we realize that investment behavior over time is probably the single most important determinant of your long-term performance as an investor. Um, how you behave, your, your discipline, uh, whether it be adding on a regular basis or, or just not selling when things are going down, that, that behavior determines how you, you do as an investor over time. How do you... Um look at the markets how do you know what to invest in right if if i can if i can do what you're doing i don't need you i don't need to pay the fees whatever it is i'll read the books i'll watch the youtube videos i'll get smart i'll get educated and save myself the money outside of having 
that emotional bodyguard, what are the benefits of having an advisor? It's a great question. Uh, the emotional bodyguard is very important. You know, as you see, people people uh, will react and do things differently when they're under pressure, when they feel stress, and when markets go down precipitously, when they go down quickly. Um, people have an enormous urge, generally, to do the wrong thing, to sell at the wrong time, um, or maybe even to buy things that they shouldn't be buying, uh, which are too risky for them. Uh, but I think the advisor provides, uh, for the most part, beyond the emotional bodyguard, is the advisor provides advice beyond just the investing. Um, there's a lot of tax advantaged accounts that people are not aware of. For example, setting up uh, a defined benefit pension for a business owner, profit sharing, or 401k, uh, determining how much to put in for the employer, for his employees. Um, that represents a huge tax savings. Again, we have people that are saving in the hundreds of thousands a year by putting these plans at work. Uh, there's lending that comes into the play. Uh, you can borrow against your portfolio. Usually the rates that people are able to borrow against a portfolio are lower than any other rate you'd be able to get on a real estate transaction, um, you know, often at half or less. So being able to borrow against securities, you engage an advisor for that. Uh, securing a loan, a mortgage against a house, um, an unsecured credit line, some clients will want a credit line just based on their overall balance sheet. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's important to have that. The advisor can set that up. And I think maybe most importantly is just the overall estate planning, making sure that your assets go to your kids uh, in a tax efficient way. People don't realize that th there's so many, so much detail to the tax code and it changes every year. Mm -hmm. um, so in addition to your CPA, which is important to have a good CPA, uh, an advisor is sort of the quarterback with all your finances. Um, clients who have in excess of around 12 million, 12 million per spouse, when they pass away and give money to their heirs, a lot of people don't realize that approximately 40% of everything in excess of that 12 million per person is taxed and it's due within nine months mm. of the person passing away. So, you know, just for simple numbers, you have somebody within a state of a hundred, a couple within a state of 124 million. Mm -hmm. Again, it's a, it, it, just for round numbers. Um, the first 24 approximately not subject to tax. The next 100, you know, 40 million in taxes and that's to do within nine months. And a lot of people don't have the liquidity. They have real estate, they have other assets that are not liquid and they need to sell them in order to pay the tax when it's due. So engaging an advisor to plan around that and to make sure that assets are moved into various trusts, LLCs, uh, can save millions literally in, in taxes. And on a simple letter, le level, uh, also just making sure beneficiaries are organized, I think is hugely important. A lot of people overlook by trying to do things on their own. We got to make taxes a stock, and then I want to invest in taxes. Taxes is doing really well. Sure. That's crazy, though, that, that it, it, if someone's not planning correctly, a family member will lose out millions of dollars because they didn't plan. Sure. It's wild. It's wild. You know, you think about it like, why? You know, it's just one family, you know, but you're saying that there are ways to protect part of that wealth. There's a lot of ways. Um, there's also, you know, families who may be more charitably inclined, want to have a foundation. Uh, it takes planning. You don't just, you don't just, it doesn't just come up on its own. You've got to set up a foundation. Some clients want to set up donor advised funds. There's all kinds of tax benefits by setting that up. You know, let's say you have an, an asset or a stock that's appreciated and you want to donate it to a charity. Uh, someone who, who's not educated may sell the stock, pay the tax and then give the cash to the charity when you could have just taken the stock, moved it to a donor advised fund, sold it there and not pay any tax and then send it to the charity. So there's all kinds of different things that you can do and navigate around. Uh, it's important to be aware of it and also to, to have somebody that's at your side that's able to execute. We want to do a whole episode and we're going to on real estate investing and people getting approached by friends, family, hey, put money into this, you know, building that I'm purchasing and, you know, sort of risky, risky investments that sometimes do pay off. And we generally, we spoke about, we generally hear about the success stories. We don't hear about how many people lost money on, say, Bitcoin or real estate or things sure. like that. Do you feel phone calls from people that say, hey, I just got a tip or not a tip necessarily, but... I just got a phone call where a 
cousin of mine wants me to invest in A, B, and C. Sure. And, you know, it could be a good investment, could be a bad. It's hard for you to say. How do you, how do you walk them through that conversation to see if it, it, it does make sense for them? It's a very valid question. It comes up a lot. Um, people ask all the time, uh, should I invest in this you know, private offering, real estate deal? Um, you have to invest in what you understand. That's the bottom line. Uh, something you don't understand, something that doesn't make sense to you, it's too new to you, usually the answer is no, you should run away from it. Uh, when it comes to family, again, there's emotions involved. Uh, if a family member is asking you to invest with them, it's complicated. Uh, it, it sometimes works out, but from my experience, uh, most of the time it, it doesn't when you have these small private investments, especially ones that you don't understand. Um, you have to really evaluate it and understand it case by case. We talk about how easy it is to buy items on Amazon, right? Now with the Robin Hoods of the world where it's just so easy to buy stock. And I find myself buying stock because, oh, Amazon's up. I'm going to purchase the stock, you know. Oh, I just heard about this new company, IPOing. I'm going to open up the Robin Hood app and just purchase some stock. I never end up making money over the long term because it's just me. I don't really know what I'm doing. It, do you find that more and more people having access to these platforms where they're buying securities more easily is is a bad thing? Is it a good thing? Is it allowing more and more people to invest in the stock market? So overall, it's a great thing. How do you how do you view personally those apps, and are they good or bad? It depends on the individual investor. Uh, again, most investors, when you have a down market, they're tempted to, to do the wrong thing. And, and oftentimes, with a lot of these apps where the investor can go in and out at their choosing when no one's advising them, oftentimes they will sell at least a portion when things are down. And that's generally the wrong thing to do. Um, as far as just broader investment among the community and people investing and having easier access, I think that's great. I think people should. Uh, it's good that they have easy access and they should participate. Um, but I think the discipline and the and the emotional guard is is super important you don't have that with a lot of these uh smaller apps um plus with, with the robo advisors and the apps you don't have the advice it's so all that we talked about the tax savings the lending the estate mm -hmm. planning uh you know robo advisors are not advising you on that so to me that that's more important that's worth having somebody to to advise do you have a financial advisor or because you're in it and you completely know what the emotions are behind it and you have your own strategies, so Eric doesn't need a financial advisor. So I'm lucky to be surrounded by a lot of smart people um, among my team and among coworkers and friends who are at different firms also, so we talk all the time. Uh, so to answer your question directly, I'm my own advisor and I, I manage my own investments, but I'm constantly surrounded by, by smart people and getting information and feedback and bouncing ideas off of others. So to reiterate, if we are to see a recession at any point in the next 100 years. What are some key elements people should keep in mind so that they can not hide under their bed and actually invest and take advantage of a downturn? Great. So point one is invest systematically. If you're investing automatically every month, you'll view downturns, as I said, as, as to take advantage of them and not as a victim of the downturns. Number two, don't try to time the market because uh, over time the market's going to go up. And no matter what the crisis of the day is, things always rebound. I remember a story when I first started in the business. Um, it was September 2001. I actually came to New York during my training right out of college, and I was there September 11th week. The training started Monday, September 10th. Tuesday, September 11th, I remember it was a sunny day in New York. Mm -hmm. I was in midtown Manhattan. Our training was in downtown arrived to uh, the office in the morning. This is my training as a financial advisor. And we see first tower on fire. And as we're watching, we see the second plane hit mm. live out the window. And I remember coming back to LA a week later and calling people and asking them to invest. And I don't know if you remember, you probably don't remember what, what was the S&P at that time, right around the time of September 11. So the S&P was around 1,000, 1,000 to 1,100 at that time. And the market fell, market was closed a few days after September 11th because of the shock. It opened a few days later. The market fell, I want to say around five to 7%. I think intraday it was down seven. It probably closed closer mm -hmm. to five. And it would end up going down about 11% in 
which is a pretty steep decline over a relatively short amount of time. And I remember calling people and at, you know, trying to um, work on getting new clients. And I remember someone on the phone said, did you see what happened in New York last week? And I'm thinking to myself, I was there. Of course I saw it. And he, sa- he said, I would never invest. Everything, is, you know, the economy is in trouble. Look what's going on in the world. Click. Uh-huh. And you look back and you, you, you pull the camera back and you look at time. The S&P was at 1,000 at that time. The S&P today is close to 4,000, even after a meaningful dip. And that's not including dividends reinvested. Right. Um, that's something very important to consider. So over time, the markets grow. And again, we're not even factoring dividends in the market. It was up four times during that period. Um, whatever the crisis of the day is, generally passes. Uh, I have another story, um, which I heard from somebody internal at UBS who's, who's old or someone very senior. And he wrote this in an article that was distributed. And the article said that when he was a young trader, he used to visit one of the local bars in Wall Street. And it was the week of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the 1960s, October 1962, I believe. And everybody was very nervous and tense, and no one knew what was going to happen. And I guess that particular day, there was a rumor that Russia had launched missiles. And he walks into the, the bar, and he's speaking with a senior guy and getting his advice. And he tells, tells the guy, Jack, uh, you hear the rumor, missiles launched, I'm try- I, sh- I should be selling everything. And Jack, the senior advisor, he turns to me and says, no, you got it wrong. He says, you should be buying right now. Because if you're right, and God forbid something happens with the missile, the trades are not going to clear. There's no one around to, to clear the trades. And so the, the, the lesson's important that no matter what the crisis of the day is, uh, you buy on dips. Mm. Because over time, uh, the world continues uh, and things get better. I love that. If people did want to get smarter, read up, um, there's so many YouTube videos now where the amount of education available is, is crazy. I mean, you can just get lost on Wikipedia, just reading and getting smarter. But there are smart people that have created books that I'm sure you've read. What do you recommend to people? And we'll put these in the show notes in terms of links um, that people can click and buy them. It's a lot of great books. Um, I'll give you my top four when it comes to investing. Number one is Simple Wealth, Inevitable Wealth by Nick Murray. Second one, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. Third is A Random Walk Down Wall Street by Burton Malkiel. And fourth is Money Master the Game by Tony Robbins. Uh, all excellent books, very relevant uh, and really timeless. Awesome. We're going to put that in the show notes. I did have a question about people that have lost out on decades of compounding and this idea that if you're in your 40s, 50s, 60s, it's too late to start investing, right? Okay, maybe I can make a little bit, but like I lost out on on two decades, 20, 30 years of compound interest. It's over, you know? Maybe my kids, I'll tell my kids about it, but for me, it's too late. What do you what do you tell someone when they call you up with that? Yeah, it's a it's a fair point. Um, I think if you compare it, if you're investing the exact amount over time and you're starting much later, you're not going to catch up. The, the reality is, the more years ahead you are of the other person who has invested, the more you're going to be ahead, all else being equal. But it's really never too late. You know, if you're if you're 30, 35 years old, you wish you started at thirty. If you're 45 years old, you wish you started at 40. If you're 65, you wish you started at 60. Mm -hmm. You're always going to wish you started earlier to take advantage of the compounding. Um, But I think the bottom line is to have to start uh, to do something systematically and and just to to start it no matter how old you are. Is it risky to mitigate that loss by investing more heavily? Meaning they're closer to retirement. So they say, okay, I want to make up those lost years of compound interest, so I'm going to take a good chunk of my retirement. And if this pays out, I'll be way ahead of had I started investing at 21 or you go, no, 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 slow down. You you know, we believe in investing, but taking most of your retirement and then betting that is too risky. How do you look at the two? Right, so it comes with a caveat. So the answer is yes, you should invest more, whether it's in real estate and stock securities, but you have to have your safety in it beyond that. Um, When you invest in stocks, or really any, any type of long-term asset, your, your time horizon has to be uh, not a few years. Uh, it's got to be very long-term. 
I, I tell people if you invest in stocks, you know, people ask, what should my time horizon be ideally? And the answer is not three years, five years, 10 years. The answer is really forever. You should never be selling your securities because over time, they're going to always appreciate in normal economic times. You know, if you see prices going up and you believe that prices will continue to go up, stocks over time will continue to go up. We'll be right back to this week's episode. But first, a word from Shmuel Shaiwitz and approved funding. We talk a lot about emotions and the feelings we have when we're making a financial-based decision or we're holding back from making a decision. I'm sure that plays a big role, right? Your phone's ringing off the hook and people call you up and they, they just saw a news headline. How do you and your t- team react to something like that? So it's a great question. And fortunately or unfortunately, when it comes to our business, primarily people buying homes for themselves or even investment properties, a lot of it, and you can sense and you can see, a lot of it is emotionally based decisions and feelings that are that are taken into account for a lot of people. And for us, we have to, at least I try to walk the fine line of incorporating the emotional aspect to it, as well as the fiscal understanding of it. And I'll give you a great example. Um, I've said this in the past, when we were buying our house, we, we, we walked into the closing, we finished signing all the documents, we, um, everybody was congratulating us, everybody left the room, I turned to my wife Esther and I said, congratulations, mazel tov, I just wanna let you know, it was December 2006, I said, I just wanna let you know, we just overpaid for the house and I think the market's gonna crash. Mm. And at the same time, and I tell everybody, we never regretted a day in our life. I never looked back at it in a negative way because it wasn't an emotional thing. I I incorporated both the emotions and the um, fiscal, like just reality of it, which is we needed a bigger house. Mm -hmm. We had a third kid, thank God that was coming. And the numbers made sense. We knew that we were qualified. We knew that we had a reserve. We knew that it checked all the boxes. So there were a lot of reasons why it made sense. And then in terms of the emotional aspect of me thinking we're overpaying, we definitely paid top dollar. The market's gonna crash. There's gonna be some kind of a, never did I imagine a 2008 housing crash and crisis, but emotion aside, I knew that it, it met all the needs of our, of, of our family, personally and financially. And at the same time, because it wasn't a short-term purchase, this wasn't a fix and flip, this wasn't something that we were gonna be moving in a year because I'm doing residency, this was a longer-term um, outlook. So for us, okay, three, four, five, six years, nobody could predict the future with certainty, but mm-hmm. we knew the market, even if it did come, you know, even if it did um, go down, we knew that it would um, go back up and true to form, you know, thank God, since 2012, the market has not gone down until you know now we're starting to see a little pullback, but it's pulling back off of, his, off of historical highs. So even what people may start to think of during times of recession where they might be worried that, oh no, my home is gonna lose um, value, my question to them is gonna be, why are you buying this house? Really, we're gonna peel back and start from the basics. Why are you buying this house? What does it do for you? What are you trying to accomplish? Um, and what are your short-term goals? What are your long-term goals? And if in fact they need it for their home, financially they could afford it, it makes sense for them, they're qualified, then great. Even if it goes down 10%, if you were paying rent, you'd be losing that money in rent. Mm -hmm. And then we look at it from a mathematical analysis and more often than not, and again, it's not uniform, it's not universal across the board, more often than not, if you take the emotion away, the numbers kind of speak for themselves. If someone wants to shoot you an email, is there an email address you give out to the public? I will give you my personal email just for the uh, kosher money people, shmuel at approvefunding.com. Okay, be great. a pleasure. Awesome. We'll put it in the show notes. And now back to this week's episode. How do you view retirement? I don't, I'm 36. I don't know how much money I'm going to need for retirement. And even when I retire, you know, if my kids ever need money, my grandkids, I need to be able to have... Um, that available to to give to them so retirement even becomes murkier than it just being about me and my wife how do you how do you even begin to have that conversation or even before you have that conversation how do you map that out to ensure that someone has enough for retirement so take a step back you know when you're retired the goal is to have income that's passive that exceeds what you're spending 
So that could be achieved by having rental income from property. It could be achieved by having dividends. It could be achieved by having interest from the bank. But I think the important thing is you have to set aside enough assets to generate income. That's number one. Uh, you want to know how much? You know, general rule of thumb, for every 100000 that you'll need to live off of, you know, after Social Security and pension, you should have 20 to 25 times set aside. Right? So if you're going to need 100000 of income, you should have at least two to two and a half million set aside to be able to draw off mm. and not have to uh, deplete the capital over time. Because remember, people are retired longer and longer. People are living longer. I'll bet you in the next 20 to 30 years, the average life expectancy will, will continue to rise. And if people are living into their early to mid 90s, and that, that'll probably be pushed up mm-hmm. over the next 50 years, they're gonna be retired longer and their assets are gonna be sitting without them working. So it's very important to be able to save as much as possible in order to live off of that amount. Do you, does life insurance come into to your conversations? You know? Yeah, so, so life insurance is hugely important. Um, young people and older people, uh, there's insurance that's relevant for estate planning to make sure that the estate taxes are paid so assets don't have to be sold, especially for people that are heavy in real estate. If you know there's an estate tax issue, Life insurance helps tremendously because it provides the liquidity to pay the taxes. But for younger people too, a lot of younger people that I see that are in their 30s or 40s that are married with kids and don't have insurance are probably making a big mistake. Mm. It's, it's very cheap to buy a term policy and to protect your income stream. You know, someone, someone who's working, you know, who's in their 30s or 40s, imagine how many more years of income uh, they would lose if God forbid something happened to them. So you're paying pennies on the dollars to get insurance and you're providing that for the family. So hugely important and something that's that's part of the conversation. Do business owners call you up? We do have a few listeners that are business owners and they always want to hear strategy. And I know how life insurance can play a role in that, buy-sell agreements, things sure. like that. Um, what, what general advice do you give to business owners as it relates to either investing, um, agreements, insurance, things of that nature. All right, so business owners uh, should all have a good accountant and a good attorney to, you know, in addition to the financial advisor. A buy-sell agreement if you have a partnership is hugely important. Uh, you don't want those things to be decided after a partner, God forbid, passes away. Sure. Um, so having the insurance, having the agreement in place, having a retirement plan, uh, a 401k, a pension, also hugely important, especially if you have a business where there's not so many employees. We have a lot of clients where it's just the family that are the employees. Uh, so there's a huge advantage to setting up a retirement account. Um, and again, we're not talking about the 6,000 a year in IRA right. savings. We're talking about you know, 50, 100, a few hundred thousand a year that you could put aside annually and get a deduction on. So that, that's, that's, worth, uh, that's worth quite a bit in savings. We talk also about, and I'm trying to hit on as much because there will be people watching this interview and this interview will be, our 30 something episode. And even though there are points here that we covered in episode 16, 22 and 25, their first exposure to kosher money will be this particular episode. I do think invest had invest in a recession, or I'm just trying to think of titles for, for an episode like this. That's why I'm trying to hit on different key elements um, of this. And even though we covered this with Alan Gibber, a lawyer in Baltimore, I want to hit this home. I want to get your take on it. When someone does pass away, many times the spouse has no idea of what um, what their portfolio looks like. Access to their accounts, bank accounts, um, securities, bonds, whatever it is. You know, Does that come up as an issue in your line of work? And what do you tell clients? Sure. So from experience, uh, especially when people are managing accounts on their own without anyone, you have a lot of accounts, but they don't necessarily have beneficiaries. That's step number one. You know, people spend, I've seen people spend thousands of dollars on a trust, mm. and the trust is literally sitting in their drawer in their house, and none of the accounts have been updated. It doesn't do you any good. Uh, when you set up a trust, number one, you have to go to each of your banks, brokerages, and you have to have the accounts updated to the title of the trust. Number two, any real estate that you own needs to be held in the proper title. So if it's your family residence, usually you're going to, update the title of the house to a living trust. A lot of people don't do that. They neglect to do it. And it's literally sitting in the drawer without, without effect. So 
having a living trust is important. It avoids probate. Uh, make sure that the kids and the family inherit without court issues, without fees, without delays. That's step one, um, setting up a living trust, especially if you're married, you have children, you have real estate. And then beyond that, you know, the planning comes in. There's other types of irrevocable trusts and LLCs that come into play, depending on what type of planning you're trying to achieve. But on a basic level, making sure your accounts have beneficiaries, number one, and having a living trust and having your assets held in title of that trust. I see that as another advantage, not to sell the idea of a financial advisor, but I see that as an advantage because an advisor will help you with the ongoing housekeeping of those sure. accounts, right? If I were to set this up myself and do it well, who's to say in five years I'm updating that the way it needs to be? Absolutely. Leaning on you. you so you're having these active, you, you, I'm sure you have a playbook, right? Like sure. a process yeah. of, hey, we've had this account for you know five years, every year, every five years, we need to be doing A, B, C, and sure. D, and you have to be proactive because I'm the client here. I, I don't even sure. know what I need to do, right? So that that's super important. Um, in terms of closing remarks, things that we didn't cover that I should have asked, um, I open the floor to you to educate our audience. I'm hoping this episode does get hundreds of thousands of views. And, you know, even though the idea of when we bring a guest in is that their phone not ring off the hook or their email address, we, we don't want to bombard people. But to start, um, what is the best way for someone to get in touch with you or your office, um, whether email, phone number, whatever it is, and then closing remarks to uh, leave people with and something that they should think about. Sure. Uh, so email eric.zamel at ubs.com, A-R-I-C dot Z-A-M-E-L at ubs.com. Uh, I want to just summarize some of the main points that we talked about. We talked about difficult markets. You know, this time is different is really the perception. Uh, it's generally not. You know, markets will react first and think later. Markets generally go down more than they should. And they really start to recover when people are at their most pessimistic state. Uh, don't sell unless you need cash. Bottom line, that's rule number one with, with investing. You view drops as an opportunity. When markets drop into a correction, uh, typically on average, the market's up about 25% a year later. We'll see if that holds true today. But when you say, does. when you, sorry to interject, when you say don't sell, it doesn't mean that if you're in a, if you invested in a something terrible, you shouldn't at least salvage your cash. You're talking about from a financial advisor's perspective of something that is diversified, right? Correct, right. So we're, we're correct. In general, if you're owning broad-based investments that are tracking the overall market, you want to try to hold right. and not sell unless you need, need the cash. There's always going to be certain opportunities to sell and maybe harvest a loss and go into something else. Right. But as, as a general strategy, you don't want to exit when things are down because uh, I, I'll tell you, the worst feeling in the world with investments and I've seen this play out with clients that have tens of millions of dollars, is not seeing the money go down temporarily. It's exiting and then having it go up and watching it without you. Mm. That's the worst feeling in the world. And that, and that can be a, a, a permanent thing that you can't, you can't make up. Um, so that's something to avoid. Next, uh, again, view drops as an opportunity. Down markets, uh, especially bear markets, create an opportunity that we typically don't see uh, only once every seven years. Uh, the most important factor in determining your long-term return is not performance, it's behavior, something to keep in mind. I have, I have a chart in my office, which we refer to very often whenever there's a down market, whenever there's a dip. And the chart, we have two charts. One shows every recession and market performance going back to World War II. And the other one shows every dip of 5% or more since the 08, 09 financial crisis. And I always like to look at that because it puts things into perspective. The market dropped 10% for this reason, 20% for this reason. You had the uh, Brexit one year. You had Greece threatening to default another year. You had oil prices fluctuating. You have interest rate. There's always something going on, and the market's going to react, and, and the pattern is very similar. And we put it into perspective, and you see how things have reacted in the past uh, and how things recovered. It puts it into perspective. We talked about uh, dollar cost averaging, buying regularly, being a participant as an investor to take advantage of dips and not being a, a victim, harvesting tax losses. So if, if something's portfolio is down and you want to sell and go back in immediately to harvest the loss, you mm -hmm. can retain that capital loss and use it to offset a gain in the future. That's important. That's something that's, that's done during this time. We talked about common investor mistakes. You know, three main mistakes are timing the market, 
uh, being undiversified and chasing performance. So we talked a lot about timing the market, how not to, why not to do that. Uh, being undiversified, a lot of people will think that they should be picking individual stocks uh, or picking sectors, energy, tech, you know, whatever the hottest sector of the day is. And that's risky too. That's, that's a risk that you want to try to avoid. Being diversified and owning something tied more to the broader market over time is a much safer bet. Uh, we talked about risk, defining risk. Uh, over time, volatility really doesn't present risk, doesn't represent risk to the long-term investor. Uh, chasing investment performance, you know, just because something did well in the past, the sector of stock, it doesn't mean it's going to do mm -hmm. well in the future. Again, stick to the general market when it comes to investing. And then we switch to uh, principles of successful investing. Uh, principle number one, you have to asset allocate and diversify. It says in the Gamora and Bava Metzia that a person should divide his money in three ways. Mm -hmm. right? A third in land, a third in in hand and a third in business. So it's not shot, but I'll, I'll use the third in business to say that you should invest in something uh, similar to stocks, give your own business stock. Uh, and it's not to say that that allocation is really relevant to everybody today. It really depends on your economic circumstance, but the message is clear that you should diversify. Uh, you shouldn't be in one thing. Uh, patience, number two, uh, there's a rule of 72. You take 72 divided by the interest rate, that tells you how long an investment will take to double with compounding importance of having a long time horizon, discipline. Uh, don't go in and out of the market. Your time horizon for investing should really be forever. Never invest with intention to sell in a week, in a month, in a year. Uh, that'll get you into trouble. Um, Nick Murray, one of the authors I mentioned, he has a quote that I like to use and I keep in mind. And the quote is that all financial failure comes from reacting to the market. And a lot of financial success comes from acting on a plan something important to consider. Uh, another principle in investing is how to deal with setbacks, you know, avoiding the big mistake of selling at the wrong time. Benjamin Graham, famous investor, used to say that the investor's chief problem and even his worst enemy is likely to be himself. Uh, most, if not all, really successful people I know have had setbacks, uh, but it's how they deal with them that make them successful. That applies to life in general and also investing. So when you see a downturn, when you see a setback in the market, in life, it's your reaction to it that really determines how you're going to do. Again, investor behavior is the most important determinant of long-term success. We had a guest on, um, Rabbi Benjamin Blech. He had the ultimate setback. He lost, he made $7 million and he lost nearly $7 million. But his life completely changed after he lost that money. His viewpoints on what's important and helping others through that and how his money is not, a reflection of who he is. His money is separate from him. He used to ask himself, what am I worth today? And then he realized that after he lost his money, that his money doesn't determine his value. So when you mentioned, you know, taking emotion out of that setback and, and seeing the bigger picture is so, so important. Absolutely. There's uh, if you ever go to Philadelphia, uh, you see there's a Rocky statue where, where the steps are. It's not at the top of the steps, it's actually at the bottom. And at the bottom of the statue, there, there's a quote. And it's a really important quote, and it's something that I, I've remembered. And it says, it's not how hard you hit, it's how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. And that's, that's how life is, is won, really. Right. Right? There's always going to be things that come up. Uh, in investing, there's always going to be things that come up. I don't care if you're in real estate and stocks. There's always dips and downturns and challenges. But your reaction to that, your ability to take it and overlook it, really determines how you do long term. Um, and then lastly, I think don't invest alone. You should have somebody that's advising you. There's a lot of rules that are changing when it comes to taxes, estate planning. Um, you need to have someone that's coaching you and giving you ETSA, very important. Uh, lastly, just strategy, just to summarize uh, strategy. Number one, set a goal to live off cash flow retirement. A lot of people don't realize that, that securities pay dividends, right? Stock dividends have increased about fivefold over the last 30 years, uh, while the market's also gone up about 10 times. Um, cash flow is important. Number two, and probably the most important thing, if you're going to take one single idea from this talk, it's determine how much of your paycheck you're going to keep for yourself and your family before you spend a single dollar on other expenses. Number three, control your spending. Uh, there's a lot of very wealthy people who spend out of control. 
uh, Mike Tyson, it's told, made more money in his time at the time than any other boxer in history, nearly a half a billion, but he went into bankruptcy from spending too much. Uh, I've, read, I, I've read of an athlete uh, who carries a backpack of, of cash uh, just in case he's got to make an emergency deposit at the, the Louis Vuitton or the Gucci store. You know, people, people spend out of control. Um, and you can spend on yourself and you can spend on your family as long as you're setting aside something for yourself too. That's important. There's, a, there's another Gamor and Cholin. It says that you're supposed to spend on food and what you eat below your means. You're supposed to spend on clothing at your means and on your wife and kids above your means. And that's something that's hugely important. Spend on what's important, spend on your family, but you've got you've to have discipline in certain areas of your life and you have to pay yourself as well. Um, saving into something that's gonna appreciate. Don't save into a bank earning 1% and consider it done. You have to be buying things that are appreciate. Automate your savings. Uh, Burton Malkiel, the author of one of the books I mentioned, said the best way to save is when you don't see the money in the first place. Uh, another Gomorrah says that there's blessing found only in that which is concealed from the eye. It's in Baba Mitzi also. So having things autom automatic. Uh, and you have to remember that your financial future in large part will flow from your ability to save systematically. Uh, you don't have to earn millions a year. We talked about the UPS employee who earned no more than 14,000 a year and saved 20% of his paycheck in stock. It grew to, uh, to over 70 million. Uh, not 90, it was over 70 million at the time. Um, Albert Einstein called compound interest the most important invention in all of human history. Uh, you have to set formal written goals, make them date and dollar specific. Um, and I, I'll tell you, there's a, I'll conclude with this. There's, a, there's an interesting idea. When you hear a speech or you hear something inspiring, you listen to something inspiring, um, it's not going to change you necessarily. You, you go on to your day the next day and you, you forget about it. How many times have we gone to listen to something and we're inspired and, and you're, you're, you were charged by hearing something, but then you forget about it a week later, a day later. Mm -hmm. The only way to affect a change is by building that change into your routine. And that could be doing something automatically. So unless you change your routine and you build that change into your routine, whatever inspiration you get is just going to dissipate. Mm -hmm. So take, take what you learned, put it into practice, and do something that's routine. Um, and I'll conclude with that. That's awesome. I would highly encourage people to rewind this, go back to the beginning of the episode and listen to it again, grab a pen and uh, jot this stuff down. Um, if you have any questions, reach out to Eric and uh, thanks so much for coming down. Thanks, Ellie. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks again for listening to Kosher Money. I'm your host, Ellie Langer. It's produced by Living L'Chaim. They have many shows. You should check them out, livinglechaim.com. They have Inspiration for the Nation. They have That's an Issue, a mental health episode. Um, show, podcast. There's so much going on. I can't even get the words right, but I don't care. We're going full force. If you have a guest idea, if you have criticism, call Yako's phone. No, visit livinglechaim.com. If you need financial help, resources, you have questions, visit our friends at livingsmarterjewish.org. They're great. Tell Zavi Woman we say hi. You can message us on WhatsApp. Yaakov, what's the number? I don't have the number in front of me. It's I like have... a 914. It's in the description as well. Yeah, I have the number for people to call up if they don't have internet. Oh, if you don't have internet, how are you listening to this? But if you have friends that would love to listen to this, there's actually a phone number in the description. You can call there. You can listen in without having an internet connection. More and more people are learning from these episodes as a result. We want not only guest ideas, we want topics to cover. Some of our our suggestions are topic driven and we'll go ahead and cover it if we feel that there's a need for that. I think I covered everything. If you're watching this on YouTube, go to the podcast app on Google, Apple, wherever it is, subscribe there as well. If you're listening to this in the car after you park safely, go to YouTube, click like on this video, subscribe. You can even be notified for future episodes. We love our sponsors. Please, please, please call our sponsors, help our sponsors, do whatever you can to help us make the wheels go round in the Living L'Chaim Kosher Money Studio. Until next time, I'm Ellie Linger, and I'll see you later. Living L'Chaim.